Hey everybody, how you doing? Happy, happy, happy Monday. It's six o'clock, it's Monday, it's the Monday snack. Hope you've had a great week. Um, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, stuff's, stuff's odd. The world's weird. It's still weird. But there you go. As I've said before, 40 minutes respite from the slightly bizarre um, situation we find ourselves in. So, got a really nice show for you. An amazing, amazing guest. Really, 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 really cool guy. Um, it's Jimmy Clark. Fabulous, fabulous bass player. All round inspiration. And over the course of the next sort of, you know, 40 minutes, you're going to find out why I find him so inspiring. So, let's dive straight in. Here we go. Here's the first bit of our chat. Okay, everyone. Today, I have with me an extremely special human being. Really cool friend, amazing, amazing musician, bass player, producer, writer, all of these things. He does it all. He's amazing. It's Mr. Jimmy Clark. Jimmy, what are you saying? What's going on? You good? Hey, hello. Firstly, thank you for having me, Andrew. It's always a pleasure to see your face. So, um, yeah, good. The pleasure is definitely, definitely all mine. We're going to get into loads of stuff. Right, so great. I will tell the folks that are watching right now. Yeah, this guy, he is an inspiration to me in so many ways, and we're going to get into those ways as we go. Right, but um, we met by chance. Right, we were we were doing a um, um, a Christian event. We we're in the house band for a large Christian event, um, and when the, within about two minutes of playing, I just thought. I've got to work with this guy again. This guy's amazing. It was it was literally within minutes. You've worked with um long time bass player for Glory Gainer. Yeah. yeah. And um and we spent a good chunk of time um working with Il Devo. Um I kind of brought you in on that when I was EMD. that was really, 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 really cool time. Very, very cool time. I wanted to know how you got into music, right? And before we, we sort of get into that question, right? It's going to be a double-barreled kind of question. I remember you mentioning to me that um, you're out on the East Coast in Suffolk, in um, Suffolk, right? Last off? Yeah. Suffolk, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you saying that it might be a bit of a disadvantage in terms of, you know, being a mover and a shaker in the music industry, being out on the East Coast, right? Um, and... You know, you you were regularly doing some mega drives, man. You you were doing some proper mileage to get to gigs, to sessions. You've done some stuff in the West End. You've done all kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And it's a beautiful trip down to Lowestoft. You know, I've done it a couple of times. It's it's a beautiful trip down there, but it's a long old it's a long old schlep. Yeah, yeah. It's a long old schlep. So I want to know, firstly, yeah, I want to tell me how you got into music, and I want to know how you made your location work to your advantage. Um do you actually think it matters where, you, where you're based? Yeah, okay, so music, how I got into it, usual kind of thing, musical family, um, parents are musical, my oh, granddad. Yeah. I don't know, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so cool. my my so my so my granddad was the bandmaster for the Salvation Army, so like brass, like brass bands, brass arranging, that kind of stuff. So my dad, um, my dad used to play bass at church, Wicked. so obviously grew up, you know, grew up listening to my dad play and listening out for bass lines and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, it was just, it's just, it was just in my blood. But the, the big kind of turning point for me probably was at about nine years old. I was sitting in English and I hated school. Just school was just not for me. We didn't, we didn't mix. And uh, my friend Matthew Wombs put his hand up in the middle of this boring lesson and said, Miss, <laughs> Um, I've got to go for my trombone lesson now. And he left. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like, just a minute, this guy gets to, like, get out of this dull lesson just because he's going to play trombone. So, like, that day I signed up for trumpet lessons. Mate. And, um, and yeah, and I've just used music to get out of the dull, boring <laughs> seven <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so every day i still kind of feel like oh it's another week that i've got away without having to be a proper grown-up human and i've just you know got away with playing music um but yeah church was like um you know a great learning 
uh, environment where you were just really encouraged whatever you did. So it was right. it was great, Definitely. you know, like learning learning an instrument with a teacher was like you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. But at church was always a place where everyone was really encouraging and sometimes it'd be amazing sometimes it would completely crash and burn but there was it was it was always all right you're always encouraged so it was a great place to kind of learn musical language as it were um and then for me a, a massive point was i watched this ron cannoli video um called lift him up and abel boreal was on bass and did this ridiculous bass solo and it was like <laughs> that was it it was like right that's my life. I'm going to be a bass player. Oh, cool. So, so in terms of location, right? Um, I'm assuming, right, that it at some point it wasn't an issue because if if you're like me and I guess like most of us, when when we get the bug, you'll go anywhere, you do anything, you do any gig, you'll you'll yeah, you'll yeah. just you any jam session, you'll you'll make it. <laughs> you know, yeah. you find a way. How did you make location? work for you when when was location the issue was location the issue what, what, how did it all kind of come yeah lo location was the the plan was always to get myself into london as quick as possible right so like growing up it was like i need to get into town i can't make it work unless i'm i'm in town that was that was it um and then so as soon as i could drive I was just so I I passed my test within a month of turning seventeen, yeah. um, you know. It was just like it was just so like I've got to you know, and used to get to Ronnie's as much as possible, and you know, just driving like completely fearlessly, like driving in central London, parking my three hundred quid Astra in the you know in the middle of Soho, and just just lapping it up. I had quite a good gig where I lived, so I had like a regular function thing, which was paying pretty well and so I was able to make a, a living even though it was a basic living from living here and also there's there was a loads of kind of gigs on the east coast like holiday camps and things like that that you could always dep in and jump in on and you know get a few quid from so I was forever like living here making money but always going into town to to, to do gigs and then I I met Mrs. Clark, well, I've known her since I was like 14, but we we got married. And, you know, if you find a good thing, you just, if, <laughs> if you like it, you got to put a ring on it, right? So I was married by 21, which right. wasn't the, really the plan because I was supposed to be Jacko Pistorius by the time I was 21. So, so I find myself as like a married man in Lowestoft and then thinking, well, it's not just me now, it's it's my wife and... Do I want to our life to be in London? Me and Mrs. Clark are here, you know, we're here in Lowestoft and it's a really nice place to live. Um, and then Jake came along and I started looking at properties. And I remember looking at like flats and things, you know, and it was like, well, this is really tough because do I just get in the car and do the drive or do I just move my whole and my whole family over to, to town. So I just tried to get away with it as much as possible. But it made coming into town more exciting because you'd right. go home and I'd, I'd, I'd really like get myself energized at home because by the sea, space, fresh air, really nice. And then getting into town to work was, was good. And it separated my brain from work mode to chill mode as well. So I could be really focused when I got to work and then really relaxed when I was at home. We spoke about it years ago. You, you were saying that, yeah, Lowestoft on paper is a disadvantage, but you did, it wasn't at the end of the day, really, was it? No, no, not at all. No, and I, I saw that from, from a, you know, from, yeah, from quite early on, because just because of surrounding, of environment, of friends, family, um, friends, family, and a nice place to be. And for me as, an, for me as a, a musician, like music is an overflow of who we are as a person. So if I'm stressed in London, I'm not going to be able to create well because my overflow is going to be tension, stress, city, right, everything yeah. like that. If I go and spend time here, then I'm energised, I'm refuelled, there's big skies, there's the sea. You know, I can, I feel way more creative. It feels like, I, you know, I've got more to kind of draw from.
Yeah, I, I love the bit of Jimmy's story about, you know, he only took up, you know, the, the trumpet to get out of to get out of school. That was actually really quite funny. Really, really funny. Let me just highlight some folks. Um Mick Crook, great to see you. Um Anita, um Stefan, Michelle, um, Andy, Martin. Um can't get in trouble this week, you know. Mrs. S is in the house. Cousin Jeff, head of the family. Good to see you as well. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Right, so. Next bit of our chat, right? We got into the whole thing um, about... Um, oh, hi. Daniel as well. See, Daniel jumped on as well. Great to see you as well. Yeah, so next bit of our chat, we got into um, how we met. Um, Jimmy made an instant instant impression with me um and yeah i think yeah you, you'll get an idea of you know just why i'm sort of so inspired by the dude check this out here we go so we we met we did this um we did this big event it was global day of prayer i remember walking in up we hadn't met and you know like yeah he's doing nice to meet you blah blah, blah. and we i remember one moment there was one moment where um i kind of thought oh this guy's right on my street you know we had all this material to kind of get through and we made some notes, and I remember looking over, and, and you'd, you'd written exactly the same figure in exactly the same way as I'd done in my chart. And I thought, you know what? This is my guy. This is my guy. I got there and realised that you were there, and for me, it was like, oh my goodness, Andrew Smalls on this. You know, it's like, and and it was classic kind of like church gig where nothing's organised, but everything will be all right, and <laughs> you know, nothing's been sent out. We're playing with like ten different people, and no one sent you any tunes to learn. And it's like, ah, and it's at a stadium, and it's like live on TV, and exactly. it's like yeah. all that kind of craziness. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, um, you know, I might just be setting myself up to fail. But I remember meeting you, and it was like just it was an honour to meet you. To be fair, because of all like you know, because your reputation of being you know, such a great MD, such a great drummer and person. It was like, oh, wow, you know, meeting Andrew, this is amazing. So so it was great to meet you. And then the fact that we clicked and it was like, oh, yeah, you know, because I felt the same. It was like, oh, this guy takes this seriously. He's, you know, he's he's actually made notes. He's actually, because everyone else like, what key is this? Yeah, this will be fine. But, you know, it was sort of, it was, yeah, it was great. It was really cool. It was really, good time. really cool. Um, so I was glad I did it. I was glad I did it. Yeah, so am I. I'm so am yeah. I. And then, obviously, um, opportunity came up where I was MDing the Il Devo thing. And I remember calling you. I remember calling you to do it, right? And and you just seemed really surprised that I was calling you, right? Yeah. And, yeah. It, and then, in in turn, I'm surprised that you're surprised. Because you were like, oh, this is a big deal. You had this whole, this is a really big deal thing. Um, you know, a big world tour. Over the whole course of it, you you just seemed completely at home in that environment totally at home um just totally on top of it unruffled you know like shelling pig this is what i do kind of thing um was it a, tell me tell me about it what was it a big deal yeah yeah huge deal because i mean i i toured i toured before you know i'd done tours with um gloria done tours with like bjorn again and other things and um but it it was a big deal for me because it was you, because you were a real inspiration. And out of all the so growing up wanting to be a musician, you hear of all the MDs that are doing stuff, and people say, well, there's so and so's MD in this, so and so's MD in this. But your name came up, and it was like Andrew. Now he's the guy, you know, he's the one that is really he's proper, you know. There was that kind of sense. Um, so the fact that you actually called me was like amazing but the fact that you called me to offer me like a world tour for like this massive artist you know which was like a you know big sort of arena tour it was like okay this is yeah that was it was it was i, f I just felt really honored i said at the start of this right that um you i find you quite inspiring in many ways um the smallest small had just been born yeah at the start yeah. of the year and um yeah. You struck me just the whole way you dealt with family, with your wife, with the, you know, with the little one. It was just, it was massive. I remember it was being somewhere and I think it was San Jose. I think it was your birthday. Right. right. And you got, you got a card or something from, from, from your family. And 
you were just really emotional about the fact yeah. you'd got this card. And yeah. man, I just I just thought this guy he's got it all. He's got he's got the chops, he's got he's got the the tour smarts, he's got the whole thing, and then he's got the whole centered centered thing going on on the other side of the planet. You and forgotten what what's important. That really, really struck me. It really, I'll never forget that. It really, really struck me. Um, let me say, I think it, I think you, the lovely Mrs. C had kind of got a little one to scroll something on the card or something. You yeah, the card, yeah. And you said, you, you said, you, oh, you're blubbing in your room because open the card. And I, yeah. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's emotional. That's, that's really cool. It's emotional. It was Father's Day. We're in San Antonio. San Antonio. And I, I know it's a San, San Antonio. Right. And we, we turned up to the hotel and... They're like, oh, Mr. Mr. Clark, there's a card, there's a card for you, and I'm like, okay. And there's this, you know, it's like my wife's writing, and I open it up, and I got in the lift. It was just me in the lift, and I opened it up, and it was like to the best dad in the world, you know. And I've not seen my kid for three months. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it was just like, oh my goodness. And I I opened it up, and Jake had handwritten it, and I'd never seen him write before, <laughs> you know. So I'm feeling like a terrible dad as it is because I'm, you know, I'm not there. I'm, you know, we're playing like games over Skype and stuff. But apart from that, you know, I feel like I'm not, yeah. you know, fulfilling that role too well. But anyway, I open up this card, and he's he's written it, and I just lost it. It was just, it was really, yeah. I would say on tour you get to see. You get to see who people are. You get to know who people are. Um, you can't kind of fake it. Um, and sort of spending time with you, just like I'm saying, character, professionalism, the whole thing, it, it was it was significant. Really, really significant. Very, very significant. Oh, well, thank so, you. So cool. Jam doing this thing, doing this thing. You know, my, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law's heckling. She's heckling. She's heckling from the crowd. I, I, I don't know what's going on. Drums next time, I promise, mum. Next time, drums. Next time, I promise, I promise. Hi, a few more folks, man. Hi, a few more folks. Um, uh, so a few people popped on. The other Daniel, great to see you as well. Uh, Maxine is back. I have to say hi to the smallest small. See, the smallest small. Last time, right, decided to go off and chat to her friends. So I'm not, never sure if she's watching, but the smallest small apparently is in the house this evening. Adam Kovac, great to see you as well, right? Time for a silly quiz. Um, you know what? The Impossible Choice quiz this week um, featured um, Jimmy making some very, very strange noises while trying to answer the questions. And for some unknown reason, I, I joined in. I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what I was doing. You, you'll see what I'm talking about. Here we go. This is the impossible choice quiz. I don't know if you caught any of the podcast, but yeah. you know, before, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. right. You know, you know what's going to yeah. happen, right? Yeah. No hesitation. No hesitation, right? Right. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. First up, um, bass players. Michelle and Degacello or Daryl Jones? Oh, Michelle. Okay. Cool, that came out quick, didn't it? <laughs> it? That came out really quick. Very, yeah. Cool, okay. Yeah. Cool. Very good, very good. All right. Okay, bass lines. Which of these bass lines do you wish you came up with? Do you wish you wrote? Yeah? I Wish from Stevie Wonder or Good Times from Chic? Good Times. Right. Man, you, there's no hanging about with this boy. <laughs> no hanging about. Okay, I try to get. All oh, right, cool. 
Yeah. Lovely. All right. Your house is burning down. You have one free hand, right? Do you save your vintage Fender Jazz or your Music Man Stingray? Stingray. Ah, I thought we'd say that, but I thought I'd throw it in. Cool. Yeah. I know that's, yeah. that's got some emotional, you know, yeah. sentimental value there, right? Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love that jazz though, man. That jazz. Yeah, it's, yeah, I know you do. <laughs> oh, man, that jazz is amazing. <laughs> Yeah. I'd come back from the jazz. <laughs> I'd run into the burning house. No, the jazz. <laughs> right, okay. Right, okay. Bass players again. Pino Palladino or Esperanza Spalding. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, uh, Come on, my friend. Uh, Pino. Esperanza. <laughs> Pino. Esperanza. Uh, yeah. We are saying... Uh, We'll say Probably Pino. I'll go Pino. I'll go okay, Pino. Okay, okay. That Esperanza gig we all went to at Ronnie's was one of the most oh, amazing goodness. music experiences oh, ever. Oh, it's that incredible, woman it? is absolutely unbelievable. Jeez. Man alive. Well, I'm, I'm saying it because I'm seeing Pino as a session bass player and her as an yeah. artist. So uh, can... but you know what? <laughs> That's why I threw that one in because I knew you'd be torn. Yeah. I knew you'd be torn. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Finally, you get the chance to play with either of these two artists. Which one do you pick? Pat Metheny or Steely Dan? Oh, uh, uh, come on. I'll go Steely Dan. Steely Dan. Okay. Oh, that's tough, though. Good. Good. Yeah. There was some, yeah, um, yeah there was some hesitation there. I like, um, I, I aim mm. for some, some hesitation on some level. That's really cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Good questions, though. Yeah, that, Esper that Esperanza gig. Do you, do you remember we were in Australia? Was it you that discovered her that, that played a thing in, yeah, in the yeah. dressing room? Yeah, yeah, and we all, yeah. And we all just went, Yeah. What yeah. on yeah. earth is going on? Yeah, yeah. The most unbelievable musician. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Cool, that was good. So we've got another quiz. That's funny. Huh? Ooh, yeah, ooh. Who's that comedian? They used to go, ooh, eh, hey, ooh, eh. Hey. I can't remember. Someone, someone put it in the chat. Who was that comedian? Oh, I've lost it. I've kind of forgotten. Anyway, that was very funny. When he was kind of going, ooh, ee, ooh, ah, I just thought, why did I suddenly join in with this? Uh, oh, stupid. I was thinking. What was I thinking? There you go. There you go. Anyway, cool. Right. Um, what are we doing? We've done right. Now, this next part of the chat, I'm, I've got to admit, I've got to admit, Jimmy is a legend, right? And I got quite emotional, actually asking him these questions. And for those of you that don't know Jimmy, and don't know his story, you're gonna understand, you're gonna understand why. Okay, check check this out, here we go. This section of our chat is gonna be probably about the most inspirational thing that I um, associate with you. Um, so I remember being sat in this room, right? It was quite late at night, working away, and I get a text on my phone and you texted me and you tell me you've got cancer, right? And I'm like, what? And I think I called you back straight away. I thought I just called the phone. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, over that whole process, I want to talk about, you know, just general things, but I'm probably going to come, come at it from a different slant. Um, I was struck by your your calmness, your positivity, obviously rooted in your faith, yeah? You're still very driven, right? Um, but, and obviously your health had to be like number one priority, but your focus, that whole positivity, I keep coming back to that, and focus with other, other, other worldly, right? Now, as a creative, you're a creative individual. At what point in your recovery, did you um, feel that being creative was something that was, I don't know if it ever went away, I don't know. But at what point did you feel um, physically, mentally able to get back on on track with creating again? And, and, and talk a bit about the whole journey as well, kind of give people an idea of kind of what happened. Yeah, so just in a, in a nutshell, so what happened was... Um... I mean, we we just started tracking some of your stuff. Actually, it was around that time, and um, uh, yeah, I had I'd been feeling a bit rough. 
hard to explain really. I just wasn't feeling quite right. I was feeling anxious, which is not like me at all. I'm just always just really quite chilled. Look, and I start yeah. to feel quite yeah, it started to feel quite anxious and I'd had a I'd had a panic attack, which was like a, a new thing for me, and was feeling a bit just not myself. And I I was working in America, I'd gone over to America to work with a, a band over there for a couple of weeks. I was started to lose a bit of weight and just wasn't feeling good. And I'd been swimming and I'd swallowed some water. And so it made me feel really sick. So I went and was and I was sick and just blood came out and it's just like this is horrendous, you know. And I went to the doctors when I came back and I, he said, it sounds like you've got a stomach ulcer. So we'll, we'll get you checked out of the hospital and, and you know, get you some pills or whatever and get it, get it sorted. So I went and got, um, went to the hospital to have the old camera, you know, and all that kind of stuff down my throat. And then went to the hospital to get the results. Um, had to change my results because I had a gig over in Budapest. So I had to, you know, phone the doctor and say, oh, sorry, I can't can't come in today because I've got to go to Budapest for a couple of days. It's like, we need to see you, you know, really quickly. It's like, yeah, I know, but I've got a gig, you know. And uh, finally got to finally got to the doctors and I was I was met by this um, consultant and three Macmillan nurses. And it was just like, you know, when you walk into somewhere and you think, man, this this isn't this isn't too great. And they told me that I'd got this tumor in my stomach and that I was going to have to have my whole of my stomach removed. Um, and they said, you know, hopefully if you keep positive and you look after yourself, you can you can get through, but it's not going to be easy, you know. And um, so I just, what can, what can you do? You know, it's just crazy. But driving, driving to the hospital that day, I, I saw this rainbow and I just had this feeling like whatever happens today, everything's going to be fine. And 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 that was it. And I just sort of had this this piece about it. And I came back, you know, told told Ems and told the boys, which was just hideous. And um, I told my parents, and you know, lots of tears and all that kind of stuff. And you go through all the things of like, well, I'm not going to be working. I'm self-employed. How am I going to provide for my family in this time? How am I going to do all this kind of stuff? Am I going to die? Is this is this the end? How long have I got? And all these kind of things. And I thought, well, if this is my, if this is my last season on Earth, I'm just going to enjoy it. I can't be worried about it. You know, I've I've got a faith, so I feel like I'm secure with the man upstairs anyway. So it's all good after here, as far as I'm concerned. So I just I'll just enjoy it. You know, I sort of I went through this kind of thing of thinking, well, who's going to look after my family and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, God's looked after me so far if you know he loves me he loves my family more than i do he'll he'll take care of it and it'll all be it'll all be okay um and i got through i still i was creative through the whole process really even those mm. days where i was just on the sofa all day like when i was having chemo and a lot of treatment and stuff which was was hideous and couldn't really move i was still trying to keep creative and just like Church family was amazing. Musician families were amazing. You know, people sending me albums to check out. People sending me like, you know, just trying to keep positive and and that kind of thing. And and it was actually a really fun time. What was really funny, I think, when I was when I was on chemo, I was like completely. I can't really remember too much about that time. And a couple of years ago, there's a there's a a local band leader around here who who said to me, "Oh, do you mind if I steal your horn arrangement for um, it's a Stevie tune?" And I was like, "What horn arrangement?" And he said, "Oh, you did a horn arrangement for another <laughs> for another guy for his cruise ship show." I was like, "Did I?" And he like played it to me. I was like, oh, "That's pretty good." It's like, "When did do that?" And I was like, right in the midst of my <laughs> like being on <laughs> chemo. <laughs> so yeah, so I was kind of creative through the whole thing, but it was. It was a bit kind of hit or miss, but I just thought, no, this is, you know, if, I, if I'm if i not dead, I'm supposed to be here for a reason. So I'm just going to, you know, enjoy it and get on with it. And, you know, it's been very it's been very sobering. You know, I think when you realise that your life could potentially come to an end within the near future, it does make you kind of raise your gaze a bit and think, right, actually, why am I here? And what do I want to what do I want to achieve and what is important and. And those kind of things. And now I don't have a stomach, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Like, you know, they cut away all of my stomach and half of my esophagus, which is, you know, way cheaper than a gastric band operation. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know, right, that I know for me personally, um, I found that whole period watching you um, kind of go through that, I found that whole period really inspiring. Um, not that you're meant to be some kind of, you know, experiment for, for the rest of us. But I found <laughs> it really inspiring. I found it really inspiring. I found, I found myself kind of looking at things thinking, you know what? What whatever I'm upset about, whatever I think is a bit difficult, right? I'm I'm looking at my mate and he's and he's ultra, ultra positive. Every every time we'd speak, every time we text, every um every post I'd see from you, never defeatist. But not in an airy fairy way. In a real it really it was really encouraging for my faith as well. I guess we're not meant to look in at ourselves and kind of think, you know, oh, what effect are we having on the rest of our environment, the rest of our world. But I know for a fact, man, there are so many of us looking on at the way that you journey through that, just thinking, man, you know what? Hat, not just hats off, but in a really abstract way, you were kind of carrying me along as well, just because you were just such an encouragement. Um, it was it's a, it's a mega, mega thing, very, very mega thing. Just extension of you know San Antonio with you in the lift. It's just extension of that. It's, just, it's the whole. It's the whole. You know the whole. You're the gift that keeps giving, mate. Very very cool. Very 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 cool. So now you know why the man is a ledge. He is an absolute ledge. Top guy. Top guy. Yeah. Hi to um. Hi to Sam. Hi to Martin. All the other folks. I think I said hi to everyone else. Very, very cool. Right. Um, the next bit's quite funny, you know. Let's jump. <laughs> Let's jump into the tour life, the tour life quiz. This this is actually a bit, yeah, this made me chuckle. Here we go, here we go. Tour life pop quiz, it's a dilemma. Right. Purely bizarre, <laughs> purely bizarre dilemmas. Totally improbable, but there you go. Right, here we go. Right, so. First one, you've been away touring for a while, yeah? And you've reached an exotic location. Your mother-in-law tasked you, she knew you were going to this exotic location and she tasked you with picking up this one-of-a-kind, rare, ornate carving she'd ordered online, right? This, is, this right. thing is, it's almost priceless. She's paid top dollar, you promised her you're going to treat this thing with the utmost care, the utmost TLC, okay? Yeah. Right? You promised her. She's relying on you. Yeah, yeah. You pick up the carving, kid gloves, you've got the thing, it's in its all special packaging, it's got the whole vibe. So, um, time to go home, right? You get your stuff, you got the carving, you get in the van with the band, you do the thing, you head to the airport, you get to the airport, you get out of the van, you put the carving down, you put your base down, go in to get your case. The driver has not secured the handbrake. The van's reversing. It's either going to take out your prized Music Man Stingray or it's going to take out the carving. Which one are you saving, bruv? Stingray. I mean, I love my mother-in-law. I love her to bits. But I've known the, sting I've known the Stingray longer. <laughs> We've got way more history. You know what? I thought you were going to say, well, I can get another base. You're like, no, the Stingray. Uh, stingray. Okay. Yeah. I got that when I was 19. I've had it like 21 years. You know what's funny? You know what's really funny, right? Whenever I do this quiz, right, people just get cold. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cold. Like, nah. Yeah. You didn't even break a sweat. You're like, no, Stingray. Okay. Right. Okay. Next question. Next question. You've landed the Adele gig, mate. <clears throat> okay. You've, nice. You're doing a comeback tour. Massive, massive tour. You're on stage, mid gig, playing the headline slot, right? At an, a massive outdoor festival televised across the globe. The organizers, they messed up the advertising, right? So the 50,000 strong crowd were initially expecting Megadeth to be closing out the weekend. So it's a very, very different clientele to Adele's usual fan base, you know? But she's like, you know what? We've got to do the gig. You've got loads of rockers, basically, yeah? 
Adele works her way down the set to the point of the show where you're front and centre with her, right? Doing the huge bass solo and kind of vocal scat thing. It's a thing that goes on. It brings the house down. It's, it's a major part of the show, right? So far, the punters have been polite about the gig, yeah? But now they're getting restless. They're getting restless. They wanted Megadeth. They've, they've, had, they've had enough, right? You know, a few booze are happening. You're getting a few kind of, you know, a few plastic cups on stage. As you reach your solo climax, right? You're there, centre stage with her, you're right next to her. It's almost in slow motion. You see a plastic jug, right? Full of what you hope is beer, <laughs> right? <laughs> Flying yeah. through the air yeah. and it's heading straight for Adele's head. Oh, poor Adele. <laughs> Do you, right? Quickly scuttle away back to your base rig, right? <laughs> or, <laughs> or do you defend Adele's honour by stepping in harm's way and taking a potential number one for the team? Ah, oh, I think I would. I think I would like to say I would jump in front of it and save her. But knowing but, myself, what I would probably do is I probably would just step back and yeah, and just yeah. Oh man, Jimmy! Uh, I thought you were gonna be a gentleman, you know. No, I, yeah, I would, I would be, I would want to be, right? But, but knowing wouldn't. myself, I would. My my brain would say, my brain would say, yes, you know, you've got to defend her honor. You you take it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. That's Adele. You you look out for it. But in the heat, in the heat of the battle, <laughs> I might just do this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love yeah. it. I love that. I love that. It all depends on how many people cheered the bass solo, really. <laughs> okay. All right. Final one. Final one. Okay. You've just forged a new working relationship with a top producer. And it's looking like, you know, there'll be lots of great work to kind of come from that. And he's booked you to a session at Abbey Road with one of the world's biggest artists, right? But this artist is quite high maintenance. You're basically overdubbing bass on a few tunes. But the artist is quite hands-on, so, you know, she wants to be around, yeah? The session, the day of the session, coincides with National Bring Your Kids to Work Day, right? <laughs> yeah. So the producer, he's got his five-year-old son there, right? And the artist has brought her five-year-old daughter along as well, yeah? And her little pedigree, tiny pedigree chihuahua, right? You get the picture, right? Yeah, yeah. This is, sounds almost familiar. I'm sure I've been in these kind of situations before. <laughs> so the kids both seem like a couple of tearaways, so you kind of give them a yeah, bit of a yeah. wide berth, right? Recording's yeah. going great. Recording's going really well. Um, producer and the artist, they step outside for a minute while you go through a chart, you know, um, and, and they're leaving the kids and the dog messing about, kind of semi-fighting in the corner of the control room, yeah? Before you know it, right, the little girl has managed to get several blobs, massive blobs of blue tack stuck in her mum's dog's fur and she's got a green crayon and she's drawn all over the dog's body as well, right? Producer and artist come back in. Artist sees the dog, completely freaks out. She's losing it, right? The two kids start blaming each other, yeah? Before you know it, artist and producer, they start arguing criticising each other's parenting skills. It's a complete and utter mess, right? The kids are both saying, that was it. No, it was her, it was him. You know what I'm saying? Adults turn around, look to you, what, what happened? So, do you, right? Do you turn in crayon and blue tack girl? Or do you say you were so impressed by the new tune you didn't notice a thing? I would I'd probably pretend that I was just looking at the chart, maybe, you know, I was in the zone. <laughs> Didn't so you're see not it. turning. Okay, right. You see. Well, you Diplomat. know, Diplomat. who wants to be that? Who wants to be that person? You know, <laughs> poor crayon girl. We were all crayon girl once. Do you know what I mean? Jimmy Clark, we're done. Thanks so much. Thanks so much oh, for doing this. Thanks for having me, man. Inspirational. In inspirational. Um, we have to do some more stuff, man. We have to. We have to. We have to do some. We have to do some things, man. Yeah, we really I, should. I want. I can't really wait should. so I can get get on the road again to Sunny Lowestoft, man. Lowestoft is very cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we need to. I'd, I'd love to do some more. So, mate, hopefully, I'll see you soon, man. Thanks yeah, cool. 
Yeah, no worries. Absolutely honour, as always. All right. Cheers, Andrew. You know what? You know what I find really funny about them Christians, right? He's got compassion for Crayon Girl, right? Got no compassion for his mother-in-law's carving. Can you believe it? Seriously? <laughs> Man alive. Cool, cool, cool. Hi to Matt. Hi to Martin. Um, oh, Daniel. What you say? Oh, good. Incredible suit. Yeah. Oh, Daniel, yes, my, my serene imagination is a very sad thing. I sit around, right, when I should be working, thinking of complete foolishness. <laughs> but there you go. Folks, that's the show. That's the show. That's it. It's been really cool. Thanks, for everyone, um, for tuning in. Jimmy is a don. Jimmy, thanks for doing that as well. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. I've got a really cool guest next week. Um, yeah, very, very fun, very, very fun show next week as well. Um, so in the meantime, could you feel free to, um, dive in and check out my website. It's andrewsmall.net. Um, the track you heard Jimmy playing, Jimmy actually played an original. Yeah. Uh, it's available on my album, What Happens Now. Um, available from all the usual places. My, um, social media handle. Andrew Small Drums, that's Facebook, that's Instagram, it's also YouTube, and on YouTube later on, you can watch the whole show again in its entirety. Please, please, please do subscribe. Bang all those notification bells, do everything you can um, to kind of just help the whole thing, um, yeah, help the whole thing, keep the whole thing moving on. Um, really, really appreciate seeing you all, and um, have a great week. Have a magnificent week and I will see you next Monday. Take care, folks. See you later. Bye-bye.